I'm Anne LeCure, and I want to welcome you back to um, our, the first of our two panels um, interrogating the How Art Works um, map. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for being here to our panelists, Shaheen Shikaliyev, John Borstel, and Jimena Varela, all wonderful colleagues, and I really appreciate your time here. Um, so as Sunil and Tony have suggested, um, we know a lot about what's happening inside these spheres. And I want to point to arts participation and creation, the cognitive and emotional benefits to individuals, and the economic and civic outcomes for communities. So I was really struck by uh, what the NEA is already studying or is planning to study. So attendance demographics, participation, behaviors, patterns, preferences, uh, new methods and forms of engagement. That's a particularly important one to me and I know to some of our panelists. The effects on well-being uh, in different age populations, social and academic outcomes for children, and community livability. So just some. It's a lot of information. Um, and it's a lot to track in one conversation. So I asked each of our panelists how they might help illustrate the map from their view in the field. Um, and you have their bios in your packet, so I don't want to spend too much time on introductions. I want to really get to the meat of the conversation. Um, so it's just to give us some sense of practice and application in this conversation. Where would you put your interests on the map? What does your work look like there? What's happening in that work for you right now? So those are the kinds of questions that I pose to the panelists. But before we get to them, I want to hear from you. So um, hopefully you have a copy of the map or you've had a chance to look at it. Uh, I want to ask you, where was your last arts moment? Is it on this map? And what was valuable to you about that? So let me hear from you. Who is it? I'm going to ask for three. Somebody's got to be one. Come on. Oh, look here, Patrice, come on. You. I just have to screen a movie called Wasteland, oh. uh, which is set in Rio de Janeiro. And the story is of an artist who is um, uh, has returned to Brazil after living in the United States. And this project is around organizing all the people who collect garbage and creating mm -hmm. portraits from the garbage. Um, it really mm -hmm. is, to me, society has these different colors. Who is the guy? Okay. I think because he began to transform the lives of the trash pickers and also was able to sell the artwork, photographs of the mm -hmm. at auction in uh, Sotheby's. Yeah. And raise money to buy uh, not only tools to establish better sanity, san sanitation for the workers, but also public sanitation. <laughs> we can all use that. Yeah. Okay. Waste land. Waste land. Cool. Patrice, I don't want to let you go yet. What was the value to you? Right on, we'll take that. Who else? German. Oh, thank you. To the mic. Uh, my last arts moment uh, was uh, visiting Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington, D.C., and uh, watching the performance, the government inspector, uh, by the play of Nikolai Gogol. Uh, it's uh, very important for me, very important experience because I'm from Russia, I'm a Fulbright researcher here in Washington, D.C. And um, last two years uh, I was uh, working like a touring director uh, in Eiffman Ballet Company in St. Petersburg, bringing ballet uh, to international audience. But uh, I was wondering how drama can be interpreted, especially 
uh, Russian drama that uh, wasn't staged in Washington DC, for example, and it was the first experience of Russian drama for uh, this theater company. How can it be interpreted and uh, perceived by the audience? And uh, the most valuable thing that uh, I experienced during the show, first of all, uh, the production was uh, really great and I enjoyed it itself. But uh, the most important thing for me was uh, feeling that American audience uh, laughed at the same moments where Russian audience laughed because uh, I watched a lot of productions by Google, and especially this play in Russia, and uh, it's very surprising that uh, American company found its own way how to interpret this play, and to, found, to find uh, a specific way to the heart of American uh, spectator. and. Uh, I was really surprised that I was unified in, uh, in the auditorium with American audience and uh, we shared our common emotions. That uh, experience was most valuable for me. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we love the same moments. Isn't that great? Let me take this opportunity to say hi to our international friends who are out there. We hope that you'll be in the room someday with us. Okay, one more. Who's got it? There we go. Hi. On uh, Tuesday night, I attended an indie rock concert at the U Street Music Hall uh, by some uh, touring bands from uh, Washington State. Hang on. Indian? Indie. In indie. I okay. <laughs> I, I was getting really excited. Okay. <laughs> indie rock. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm excited about that. And I think for me, it communicated a lot about um, the landscape of the community that they were from and uh, helped me uh, connect uh, the insights of the geographical communities that, are, that make up uh, different underground music com uh, communities across the United States and connected them to what's happening here in the place that I live. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was valuable for me. That's kind of that time-space thing that Tony was talking about, how the, for me, the map gets three-dimensional and starts to move when you engage time and space, and that we can feel a sense of community with folks from another place is great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so Shaheen, I want to start with you. Um, you teach a course at the Smithsonian called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. But you're developing a new course called Drawing, is it Drawing from the Right Side of? In the Right Side. Drawing from the Right State of Mind. Yeah? In the Right State of Mind. In the Right State of Mind. OK, so tell us about that course and why the name change. Let me maybe back up a little bit so it will make a little more sense. Um, as an artist, uh, for me, the artistic process, I'm really fascinated by artistic process. And what's important and interested me in this process is, like, uh, during the creation of be it painting or drawing, or whatever it is, um, it's not only me who is affecting artwork, but artwork starts affecting me. It's, it's kind of the process of dialogue between me and the artwork. And sometimes when you have some formal issues, color or form or shape or something, you actually um, look for resolution in philosophy or in psychology or in some fields which are not really directly connected to the art. And um, I kind of realized that to experience this aspect of the art, you don't really have to be an artist. Um, hmm. you, you, you can feel this transformative, in my opinion, qualities of the art just by engaging in an art activity, even if it's not like your everyday whatever you do every day. It's like maybe once a week. And here's where te my teaching is coming in because um, I believe that a um, very simple concept, for me, simple concept of visual art, when they taught the people who actually didn't know them before, they really affect uh, not their only ability to draw, but their personal lives and their professional lives. And just not to be too abstract in that sense, like for example, the concept of the negative and positive space in a visual art. It's very simple, it's very basic. 
without understanding this concept, you can't really do any two-dimensional art. But for many people who come outside, it's kind of a little bit surprising because what we really do, we give shape and name to the things which actually nothing in everyday life. It's empty space, it's whole. And by paying attention to these things, they suddenly see the objects or the shapes in a very different way. Yeah. Or for example, we know what in a visual art, color or shape, they're not defined by itself. It's defined by the things around it, by other colors around it, by the shape. So this interconnectivity, which is in visual art, it's quite normal and you cannot really work in visual art without understanding that. Yeah. For many people who come again from outside, it's surprising and I think it can affect, again, not only their ability to draw, but what they do in their life, professionally and personally. I think it's, it's a very interesting aspect, which I'm very interested in, and that's what my teaching actually is based on. Mm -hmm. And you talked about a, a student who had a kind of transformation when they went back to their job. Yeah, next um, I obviously don't have any hard data for that to, to prove, really, but I have a lot of anecdotal evidence because I keep in touch with my students. And, um, very few of them really continue. I mean, there is some who come back and take more classes and we, uh, we work together. But most of them just take this one class and then they quite often just stop doing it uh, because they don't have time or for any other reasons. But uh, they kind of keep in touch with me and some of them tell, like, they, they see the world a little differently. They, they, see, they see the problems which they work every day a little bit different because they learn something in this class. First, I was very surprised. Now it's kind of, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm anticipated. Every time when I have a new bunch of students, I'm really anticipating who will be that person who will give me this feedback. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And can you describe a little bit the state of mind? Um, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting because, again, it's something which is really hard to quantify in a sense. But I guess it's a kind of special stage of attention, special. Uh, you kind of in your special space. It's a very uh, special kind of focus, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it is. It is uh, very interesting. It's kind of, in some sense, maybe reminds you something from meditation, but it's yeah. not exactly that because you're quite active in that process. You have to create something. It's yeah. it's not you just sitting and meditating on something. You plus physically acting. So it's very interesting balance, but it definitely focus attention to the details and seeing the big picture at the same time, which we don't really do in yeah. everyday life. Yeah, so often. you may breathe a different way or Absolutely, yeah. see it's, a different way. And seeing is actually the basic for everything. I mean, I, I, I kind of assumed, I don't even mention that, but what basically what I teach, I teach to see things. Uh -huh. And it kind of sounds a little silly because we all assume we see, but yeah. we don't really. And if you come to my class, I kind of will prove it immediately what we look, but we don't see things. Yeah. And, uh, and that's very fascinating because people don't understand that until they really get to the situation when they show what's really happening. There. Yeah. So now you all, all want to take drawing class, don't you? <laughs> Jimena, let me get you in the conversation here. Um, one of your upcoming projects is on culturally rooted management practice. Mm -hmm. Where does that territory sit on this map? And why are you interested in it? I'm so glad and surprised you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, a little bit of background of where I come from at this. My, my background is in comparative cultural, uh, uh, comparative political economy, and I teach arts management here at AU. And I teach arts management because I am completely convinced of the power of arts to transform lives and transform communities. But um, my, my PhD work was in comparative uh, political economy because in the late 90s, I was involved in a series of conversations at the World Bank on the role of culture and economic development. Um, the World Bank had launched a, a series of initiatives on developing um, and loan programs for Latin America, which is where I'm from, and many of them were failing and not working out in the Middle East as well. And the question was why? And the, the, the answer was because we're not taking into account culture. Now the fact that some, a place like the World Bank is taking culture into account and has a series of convenings to me was extraordinary. Uh -huh. um, it blew my mind. Um, uh -huh. and, and at that point I thought, well, we really have to understand um, the wider policy system in which culture is, is, is placed in order to make you know, all sorts of neat things happen. Uh -huh. So that's where I come from. Um, the project that you're referring to is, has, has two stages. One is, I'm very interested in culturally specific uh, management practice here in the US, but also abroad. I think there's a lot that falls, out of the falls through the cracks of what we teach 
in arts management, what we know about arts management practice. Um, I want to know how arts organizations, and usually they tend to be ethnically specific, mm -hmm. um, manage. How do they survive? How do because they keep making art and they're not getting grants, and they're not getting um, you know any kind of support from anywhere, and yet they're keeping on making art in the communities. How do they make that happen? Is is very interesting to me. And the second area of interest is there's a lot to and I call the second part of my project learning from the south. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to learn from other places, and I'm so thrilled <laughs> to hear you know both Sunil and Tony bring this up as a central concern, right? That there's a lot that we can learn from other places in the world, English speaking and non-English speaking as well. And in the uh, South, you mean Southern Hemisphere. I mean the real, true, deep South, which is where <laughs> I come from. <laughs> um, <laughs> those are grits. Um, <laughs> that's exactly where it comes from. So, so the gentleman earlier who was speaking about this, you know, we are about to become best friends, I think. I don't know where you are, but um, my new best friend is out in the audience today. Um, there's, there's a lot of, I, I, I've worked in Latin America for, for about 12 years before coming to the US, and there's a lot of stuff happening, again, outside the traditional systems of support that we have in the United States, but which can actually be overlaid pretty neatly on, in this map in many ways. I find this really intriguing. Um, so, so I'm very interested in seeing management practice, cultural production practice, dissemination, creation practice in other parts of the world, and in parts of the United States that are not the traditional cases that we read about or, or analyze. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when we talk about emerging methods and forms, yeah. we may also be talking about emerging understandings of management. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. absolutely. And also emerging understandings of engagement. And I'll talk, I'll let uh, John go, but. Uh, oh, the E word. Yes. Yeah, There's engagement. There's stuff to talk about. John. Yeah. Um, I have this feeling that dance exchange has probably visited every place on this map at some point. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us about your latest work, and can you place it on the map at some point in its development? Yeah, I think it's actually really interesting that we're using this term map, and I'm thinking of more as kind of a term of convenience than necessarily a complete definer of what's going on here. Because when I really tried to think about uh, dance exchange as a small but vital uh, arts organization, where it fit on this map, I couldn't make it fit until I stopped thinking about it as a map, in fact, and started thinking about it as a kind of anatomical chart. Yes. And in an anatomy, you've got a heartbeat and respiration and digestion and metabolism all happening at once. And if any of those systems shuts down, the whole system shuts down. And I think for a small, while we might place a particular project at a particular point or a particular artist, at a particular point and say it's there, I think for a functioning organization, it needs to be functioning as a kind of anatomical system. Uh, so to, so to kind of give you an example of one thing we're doing right now and how it might fit a few of these, uh, we're, a, we're a sort of newly emerging organization that's 35 years old because we recently went through founder transition. Our new artistic director is doing a project called How to Lose a Mountain. And she was sparked to do this project uh, by a trip she made into the rainforest of Guyana, uh, where she was essentially off the grid. No access to things like electricity or a system to deliver food to her or, uh, you know, turn the tap on and you get water. All of that stuff had to happen within the system of a rainforest. Um, so she got back home and was immediately shocked to discover uh, a real sense of dislocation back in her own environment because she realized she didn't know where her food came from. Hmm. She didn't know what, you know, she plugged something into the wall but really didn't understand where the electricity started. Uh, so all of these things about uh, cons cons uh, products she consumed and energy she used, where did it come from? So she got the impulse, and I love the fact that the word impulse is here on the same surface as something that's about society as well. She got the impulse, well, where is my energy coming from? Where is the electricity coming from? She did a little research. She found out that a lot of the Pepco energy is actually sourced from uh, coal that's extracted from mountains in West Virginia. And she said, I've got to walk there. I have got to walk from my home where I'm using the energy to that source of energy. And so, very much a case of impulse, but I wanna say, not necessarily that she conceived an artistic work and knew what it would look like, or said, I've got a story, I've gotta tell the story, but really this more 
this deeper sense that she had to know something. She wanted to understand something. Something was eluding her. She was living in this world where, where um, all these contradictions and paradoxes are, are coexisting. How could she manage that? And so that started her on this project, which is about halfway through. It will culminate in a dance work on stage. Um, but when she got to the point of arts participation and arts creation, what that looked like so far is her taking a 500-mile walk. And somebody looking at that might not say, oh, that's, that's, arti that's artistic creation. Uh, there's a piece of art there. It's very much central to her art-making process. Uh, and something that she is carrying as a key piece of research into the development, uh, rehearsal, and creation of this work that will premiere in the spring. Uh, and that rehearsal process is where we are right now. So I could take apart a couple of other one of these, but, but uh, yeah. you probably want to advance And where does it premiere? It premieres at Dance Place in March. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. I just want to make a point of note to the arts managers in the crowd. I see you out there. Someday, your artistic director is going to say, I got to walk it, you know? So I love that level of complication yeah. that we don't, sometimes that impulse isn't, I have an idea, I know exactly what to do. Sometimes it's much more generative and uh, one thing I know I need to do is walk 500 miles. And it's interesting you mentioned that because what we as an administrative staff discovered is that... Uh, managing an artist to take a 500-mile walk with the proper support that she wouldn't get hurt or starve uh -huh. uh, was very much a production process like getting a show on the road uh -huh. and okay. required a similar amount of institutional support. Yeah, talk mm. about skill transference, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah, from the production that you do in this kind of a theater to a walk. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. We've been talking a lot about the uh, bubbles, spheres, whatever you want to call them, um, as sort of sitting there. And I want to talk about how they move, what the dynamics are. Are there tensions there? So um, let me ask that question to you. And also, let's get you and the audience out here. So if you have a thought about where the dynamism is in the map, make your way to the mic now. Um, so let me throw it open to any of you. Um, where's the movement on the map? Are there dynamics that interest you? Yeah. Someone. Who's okay. got it? Me. OK. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, it's, there's lots to talk about here. And, and I um, talked with Tony a little bit about it in the break. But uh -huh. there's two things that jump out at me. Okay. All right, so I'm sure there's more to talk about. There's two things that jump out at me. One is that I'm not quite persuaded that the line between individual impacts and community impacts can be separated out as neatly as, as, as uh, might be implied here. Um, and I'm thinking of a particular case, and I'll talk about that really briefly in yeah, a minute. Yeah, please. Um, and the other thing, which is also tied into this, is that um, I, was, I understood it after Sunil put his, his expanded version up, but here in the bottom where we have benefits of arts to individuals, and there's a straight line to benefits to arts, society, communities, and you have economic and civic. In your expanded version, Sunil, you have a direct line from benefit of arts to individuals to society, but the direct line from that to economic impacts is gone. And I think, and what that implies then is that in this model, really what's weighing heavily between that, mediating that relationship heavily is that relationship to community and society. And I think there's an argument to be made that there can be a direct link between the benefits of arts to individuals and economic development and economic impact. Um, the, the, the story I told Anne, and there's, there's many stories like this in, in Latin America, and what I want to discover now are the stories like this that I'm sure exist in the U.S., yeah. but um, has to do with a, a theater in El Salvador called Es Artes. Uh, it's in the city of Suchitoto in El Salvador, a very impoverished rural community, and the person who started this theater is a Fulbright fellow who spent some time here in, in, in New York. And what the theater does is it takes, it, it offers the opportunity to uh, youth who are farm laborers, so who basically work in the fields for a dollar a day, um, to gain theater experience, right? Um, so, so there goes the individual value, individual benefit, you right? So you have a chance to express themselves, perform, perform for their friends. Um, but there's a heavy cost to be paid, or there's a heavy price for their families because that means losing one, one, one field laborer, 
right, for an indeterminate amount of time while they're rehearsing in the field. So what this uh, theater has done is created a school alongside uh, the theater experience where they are taught a skill or a craft. So you go to your theater classes and your rehearsals, but you also learn carpentry or sewing or uh, scene painting, something, something that will enable you to earn a living as well. And the theater has come up with local, um, very local, very small local businesses with a $1 stipend for every youth who is involved in this program. So the families get paid for the, the money that they would have earned had that youth um, been able to work in the fields. Mm -hmm. And there's another condition on that as well, which is the youth, in order to remain in the school, have to make progress through high school. They have to remain in, in going through high school and eventually graduate. Um, and the kinds of works that they produce are Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare adapted to Suchitoto El Salvador, and they do many of those productions in conjunction with the Stratford Theater in mm -hmm. Canada, um, where many of their technicians come and teach, teach them about lighting and teach them about carpentry and all these skills. So that project, where does that sit? Mm -hmm. Here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To me, that project is a very clear indication of this blurred line between the individual benefit and the community benefit, and of that direct benefit of art to the society and community, sure, but also the direct economic benefit that these youth and their families are, mm -hmm. are receiving. So it's almost like you have to take these two bubbles and put them together and make them swirl around, yeah. and, and then also live in a context yeah. where the individual is not as separate from the community, perhaps. Yeah, and, and to me that speaks to a key element of culturally sustainable development, which is my, you asked, asked me the other day, what are you obsessed with? Well, this is my obsession. Mm. Um, is that economic development, in order to be sustainable, has to be culturally rooted in some way. It has to speak to the values of the people who are gonna be involved mm. in this development in the first place, right? Um, and that's what I love about projects like that, that they mm. take into account, they don't say, oh, it's wrong for you to work in the fields you deserve better, no. This is your economic reality, this is your family reality, this is your local cultural reality, but you have this need or this desire, we can give you this opportunity there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody lining up. Do, do you not have questions? Come they, on now. They don't have torches, I don't have <laughs> um, Shaheen, let me go back to you. Uh, let me just ask you broadly, is there, is there any kind of movement or dynamic on the map? Um, I can't, I mean, um, I actually like this map very much because I'm a very visual person, so I, I start reading the report and I kind of got lost there. Mm. But when I opened the page with the map, and it kind of makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, the only thing I kind of had very interesting, you, separate education and training has um, arrow toward the arts creation and participation, but, and again, it's maybe I'm talking from my point of view, I see one of the most important benefits, in my opinion, which artists can and um, return to society is to teach, really. And um, you're teaching not only directly, like through giving classes, but even when you're exhibiting, and if your work can go through to someone, it is some kind of lesson, because again, I feel like the art, it's, in a sense, art is a statement of the, our, our, our situation in the world, what, what we, how we feel ourselves in this world. And I think through art, we get, we get accepted, we accept a lot of things which are otherwise really hard for us to accept and all these things. And this has very, a lot of educational value to it. So, I mean, I don't see kind of like backward error from arts to education and training. And I, but other than that, I think yeah. that's kind of very... So you would put it from the sun or to, the To heart education and training or... and then to benefits to individuals. And because, again, uh, and I agree with, actually, I see separation between individuals and society because I think art is, I mean at least in my opinion, it's a very individual thing because there will be painting, 10 people will don't like it and one person will like it or there is a show, 100 people like it, 10 people don't like it. So it's very individual and uh, by influencing these individuals, I think artists bring change to the society. So I kind of see that separation between individual and societal yeah. benefits. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. John? Yeah, also responding visually, and I know that the, uh, it's a schematic that's, that's by its nature trying to reduce an idea for digestion. Uh, I have a concern that it might be misinterpreted as suggesting that this is all a self-sustaining system. You know, the arts do their thing and the infrastructure comes because the infrastructure is attracted to the artist. It'll all happen and we really don't need to worry about it. And what interests me most, actually, is not so much the movement inside the system, but the movement between the system and other things in the world. So zeroing in maybe on a couple of the pods uh, and to jump on uh, education and training uh, 
it's been mentioned, for instance, that part of education and training in this system is uh, support of artists so they get the right kind of training to be artists. And that indeed is important. And it's one model. And we saw a beautiful piece of artwork from somebody at RISD, which is a signal institution and in representing that kind of idea of preparing artists. But could an institution like American University, for instance, in offering a liberal arts education, or maybe offering a science education, be actually uh, giving the artist exactly what that artist needs. Uh -huh. um, so the nature of education, not just as this art-sustained thing, art-supporting art, but the nature of a broader education actually feeding artists, and as Shaheen has suggested, then it becomes the artist's responsibility to educate to a certain level of artistic literacy within society. So, mm. so, so the education piece seems to go back and forth. And I'm even curious, uh, as we think about system multipliers, mm -hmm. I noticed that education is not on that list. And I wondered at first, oh, it's not on the list because it's, okay. it's in the system. But I, I have this passionate feeling like it needs to be in both places uh, if art's going to thrive in our society. Yeah. I feel really kind of... Uh, in a good way, complicated and challenged by the notion that our entire education system is educating artists. Because mm -hmm. I had that same, I looked at education and training as the art-specific education that we provide in and out of school for children and adults. And what you say makes it um, much, there, there are really strong imp implications for what we do with our whole education mm -hmm. system for both producing artists, but then also maybe producing creative people, yeah. too. Yeah, and that's more important, probably, to create a, uh, produce creative people than produce artists. Artists, it's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. You have to make some, some choices in your life, and one of these can be, oh, I'm going to be an artist. But uh, what for everybody's benefit, if we have more creative people, and it looks like economies kind of start demanding from us to be more creative than, because there is no more job when you can just push the paper. There's less and less that kind of job. Yeah. You have to come up with ideas, you have to solve the problems, and creativity, that's what arts can teach. Not necessarily how to draw, but how to think visually, or how to think in movement, how to think in music. I mean, that's, that's just problem solving, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, mm. not necessarily how to draw, but how to think. Yeah. That's terrific. Mm. So, you were gonna say? so one other thing that's piquing me uh, and it's not so much what's in or out of this or what's happening between the, the units of this, but it's an it's a, uh, emerging idea right now that I'd love to put next to it, and it's, is the notion of art as a form of research. Mm. So uh, how does the making and production and creation of art constitute a form of research that actually increases knowledge in society? Can we think of art the same way we think of science, for instance, as a producer of knowledge, that has its own inherent techniques uh, for uh, revealing information, for teaching us things, uh, for advancing our understanding of and comprehension of the universe around us. Uh, and that's an idea that I'm hearing both within the artistic world, uh, in my own organization, in my sustained relationship with our founder, Liz Lerman, and in some academic uh, work that I've been exposed to recently. So I'd love this idea of art as research to get sort of put on a template next to this and, and see what the resonance is. It's also a covert opportunity to get in yet another NEA category. Ah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Jimena, were you going to jump in there? Mm -mm, no. OK. Let's hear from you. Yeah, OK, great. I love, I love that last comment, uh, although it, it opens up a bunch of other sort of science metaphors to think about this. Um, this map, um, and, and there are two things that come to my mind. One is that perhaps the, we need to think about the lines of force here more, I'm not a scientist, so I'm sure I'll get this wrong, but more sort of, sort of gravimetric in that the classic sort of Newtonian sense that everything's connected to everything. Mm. So there's some lines of force that go in lots of directions. That's one science thing of a spur, but the other thing, and maybe this is a more critical question, thinking about observer effects. Uh, if you are aware of this model and this vision of how the, the system works, mm. does that change the system? If you're an artist who is very self-conscious, saying, I am trying to do something here that's producing 
benefit of art to individuals and benefit of art to society and communities, and I have this model in mind, does that do something different than an artist who, who doesn't care about that or isn't self-consciously mm -hmm. engaged with that? Mm -hmm. And so as the flip side is, can there be any artistic activity that's outside of the field, mm -hmm. uh, that isn't in that, is there antimatter? It's not affected by that, mm -hmm. that gravity. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there even a possibility of an art that says, I'm not, I'm now personalizing the art, is that I'm not engaged uh, mm -hmm. in this, that I've opted out of some of these lines of, of I'm not influence. a citizen of this state, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So What's I'm your not sure there's a question there, but it's, it's some speculations by that comment about, uh, spurred by the comment about the scientific uh, knowledge producing thing that art might contribute to this. Yeah, and do you have a hunch about that? Yeah, I think that there probably are, that there probably is a real difference that can be um, researched and identified between the art that is concerned with art and the art that is also self-consciously concerned um, with these other things. Listen. And my research question would be which one of those is more likely to destabilize and change the system. Uh -huh. mm. Right on, great so, question. So the NEA has lots and lots of money that can solve that question. <laughs> can you feel the wonk in the room? Yeah. We're getting that, yeah. What were you gonna say? Any, any yeah, responses um, or? Do you see this gray hair? It's your fault, okay? <laughs> um, we've, been, we've been arguing about that point uh, and many others uh, since we got the report here at AU, the, the, the four of us, and, and I had one of the scariest conversations in my life a few days ago with Andrew and Anne around that kind of thing. <laughs> it was a scary conversation because we really, we really did get into in very deeply to, to something along those lines. I don't have the answer to your final question. That's Sunil's province. But, um, but what do you do with someone who opts out of the system? And what do you do with an artist who says, the art speaks for itself, and I don't need to make that kind of connection? And, and, and we were talking about how, as, as professors of arts management, many times, especially in this program, where I would say 99% of our students are practicing artists, and we have to um, experience that mind shift with them from going to being the creator of the art to suddenly mm -hmm. thinking on another channel of engagement with the audience. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, that, that in many cases, some of them are closer, some of them are farther from engaging in these additional lines that you throw out. So I, I, it's not an answer to what you're saying, it's just a comment that this is very much on our minds as well. And we were thinking about the whole process of, you know, arts and arts education and linking to audiences as an educator and linking to audiences as an artist and linking to audiences as an arts manager or a marketer for that art. Uh -huh. And what happens to the people who opt out of those things and what's the influence that they have? So um, we're just with you, that's just what I'm trying to say. Yeah. We're going to be busy on we that feel your for pain. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of want to make one comment. I think artists, in a sense, must be outside the system to make comments on that system. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you're inside the system, and if you're especially very comfortable with that system, you probably will be too kind to that system. And I tell it on my own experience. I'm from Soviet Union, from former Soviet Union. And, and I, grew, I lived some part time when it was still Soviet Union before the collapse. And, the system which was required you to be, you must be in the system. It's not like there was a question, you can be outside the system. If you're outside the system, you're not exhibiting, you're not an artist, really. You can work in your house, but officially, you, you're not an artist. Nobody will really, really mm. see your work. And it actually creates the whole new set of problems when you actually, it's very hard for you to keep your independence. Because if the only way how you can survive is to be part of that system, then Every time when you want to make comment and if system doesn't like your comment, that you actually will get shut down. In that sense, I think artists must be outside the system, but at the same time, I don't think it's impossible to be completely outside the system because even when you're commenting negatively the system or you refusing to be part of the system, you're still kind of interacting with the system, so you end up being again in the system. So yeah. I think it's a little more, yeah. there is there's very hard to find who is outside, who is inside, and that's it. What I'm loving is that we're creating tensions and mm -hmm. dynamics as opposed to really specific yeah. linear enclosures. Yeah, it's, it's my sense that what we're looking at here is not the phenomenon, it's a construct by which we can try and understand the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And uh, The but, map is not the terrain. Right. Thank you. Right. So, uh, and it is not all of the terrain. You know, probably what we're looking here is a, uh, is a chain of islands, and there's stuff under the water. 
<laughs> that we don't see when the map gets made. Um, so um, there is another, so it's a construct that describes d dynamics in the system that are observable. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are other dynamics in the system that haven't been observed yet or aren't best observed through the methods that this, this study used. Yeah. But what happens, I think, uh, you know, in, in the process of knowledge building is that when somebody steps forward and sort of has the, has the integrity and the, and the drive to define this, is somebody else will come along and say, mm, not quite this, about <laughs> this, or this, or this, or this doesn't describe my reality, <laughs> look at this. Uh, and that's what's kind of exciting about yeah. uh, creating a construct like this, because it yeah. begins a dialogue where we, where we can start uh, deepening the definition yeah. uh, by virtue of hopefully inviting uh, other, other kinds of maps, anatomical yeah. systems, yeah. Uh, ecosystems uh, in yeah. which and, art and, survives. And the beauty of this map is that it's, it's uh, distilled in such a deceptively simple way, mm. right? Things that we've been talking about and relationships that we've been talking about. It gives us a starting point, right, to have these additional conversations rather than having these meandering conversations about bits and pieces of the islands, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and I loved your characterization of what about this and what about this. Um, it, felt, it, it felt like uh, artists and scientists, you know, that, that um, we don't have sort of a corner on the market um, in inquisitive thought, mm -hmm. you know? And so the idea of arts practices research and the idea that our map could be interrogated by, you know, climate scientists and yes, others oh, yeah. um, is, is a really exciting place yeah. to be. So I think we owe a debt of gratitude to the NEA and Sunil mm -hmm. and Tony. Um, let's hear some more. Yeah. I think you have yes. somebody over there. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, I'll come to you next. And yes. Okay, hey, me again. So, Hi. but this is, this is like Christmas for me. My best friend. So, <laughs> so <yeah>. Hi, best friend. <laughs> no, it's, it's just that um, when, when I see this map, uh, this reminds me a lot of conversation I had in the past, but uh, artists tend to hate me when I'm getting to these discussions because, because if you see this map in, in many ways, it's like a safe map for artists. It's a still like placing the arts in the middle and you know, everybody is around us and, <laughs> and it's safe because we can adapt everything to our needs and, and we look great, great and big and everything. But, but if you try to put this into a bigger context, into a wider context, maybe into a creative ecology or a, or a, a wider ecology of interactions between humans, then you start having a different uh, ways to express these relationships. Uh -huh. uh, and then you have a cross areas between technology, economy, political sciences, conflict management, and the arts. And, and in, in, in that regard, then you start having some part of it is research, some part of it is pure enjoyment, some other part of it is actually business. Uh -huh. and, and, and when you start looking like that, well, some creatives don't feel comfortable. But the thing is, art is not to be comfortable. Art is actually to, mm. to, to, to question what we do, and to move us forward. And if you understand that, then these interactions and trying to make it less comfortable for the artist is part of actually making it better for them. It's part of actually involving them into the debate because you don't get involved unless you are threatened, unless you feel something's at stake. If everything's safe, then, then you don't have a reason to really speak out. Yeah. So, so I would actually advocate to try to make it less, less, less art safe uh -huh. and start actually challenging the, 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 the position of the art to actually to try to make them show why everybody else has to pay attention because actually, mm. something to say is, is art speaks for itself. Mm. Well, try that in the treasure department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really intrigued by what you say. Um, in some ways, we might say that this is a map of the artistic ego. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then what you're saying everybody is that around. when you make it three dimensional and see that this map floats inside, a, a much larger system, it puts us in a different perspective with the people we're engaging with. Yeah? yeah? Definitely. Yeah. Here, you had a comment? Well, uh, just picking up maybe on, on the thing about the back of an individual process and the new artists and that their feelings about versus there's a there's a good bracket which I like at the top of your map. As you go from the top about you can possibly create to express and mm -hmm. You'll notice that the dotted line seems to be 
system multipliers have captured my attention too. Mm -hmm. they, they make the map move in important ways. And I also love that wiggle wobble that you point to at the top. That's a really uh, important moment to interrogate when the artist chooses to engage. Yeah. Okay, um, now my assignment is to send my panelists um, back to get their mics removed for the next panelists, and then I'm going to go with okay. this question over here. Right. So, but before so we, we do that, let me just change. say um, thank you. Thank you. To our panelists, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs>